Hello, everyone. Welcome to Jupe's 2011 Audiobooks and Music. Today, I'm going to be reading you chapter three and four of Liza Scotland's book called Feared. Okay, here we go. I'm going to read chapter three. Chapter three. Vitesse LLC was housed in a unique office building, a brownstone that had been stripped to its exposed brick walls, then glassed in a, then glassed and dramatically renovated as a glass box with an atrium in the center that served as a waiting room. Furnished with glass end tables and modern sectionals that matched a large square of Cecil. Sizel. Glass balconies ring the atrium <coughs> at the second and third floors where the associates' offices were located, also with glass walls through which they could be seen working. All Mary could think was how much Vitez spent on Windex. Roger Vitez himself looked in his late 40s thanks to salt and pepper, thanks to a salt and pepper haircut in careful layers. and long sideburns that tapered to a matching beard, immaculately trimmed. He was tall, trim, and handsome. Though his features were precise to a point of delicacy, with a long, narrow face accentuated by a long, thin nose, intelligent blue eyes bracketed by fine crow's feet, and fine lips pursed as tightly as a coin slot turned on its side. He was dressed in a black turtleneck and light gray wool pants, more like an art director than a lawyer. He didn't have a wedding ring, which didn't surprise Mary, because he seemed like a super picky kind of guy, which was her least favorite. <clears throat> she and Judy remained quiet as Benny pitched Roger their case and Mary took in his office, which was equally unique. It was another large glass box with a glass desk, glass table, and more glass walls. Transparent halogen pendant shone from black tracks that coordinated with black frames and clear, clear story windows. And except for Vitez's laptop, there was no lawyer paraphernalia like legal pads, memos, red accordion files, family photos, framed diplomas, or loose, loose, lucid awards. Bookshelves were also glass, and the books weren't the typical federal rules of civil procedure or Purdue's Pennsylvania statutes. But Lo Loatsu, the way of the Buddha and the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Well, Benny, Roger said after Benny was finished, he tented his slim fingers and leaned back in his black mesh chair. <clears throat> Thank you for coming over. 
I'm afraid I'll have to decline the representation with gratitude, of course. Mary and Judy exchanged looks but didn't say anything since Benny wanted to do all the talking. This was a revolting development as far as Mary was concerned. Benny had spent the cab ride here raving about Vitez that he'd graduated from Harvard Law, clerked for the Supremes, and notoriously choosy about his caseload. Now that he didn't want them, Mary wanted him even more. She fell for the supply-limited sales pitch every time. Benny leaned forward. Roger, you have to take this case. I'm very flattered, but I'm sure anybody in the Bar Association would jump at the chance to represent you. You know absolutely everyone. I suggest you give any one of them a call. But you're my first and only choice. I want you. We all do. We do. Mary said, but didn't say more. We really do, Judy chimed in. I wish I could, but I can't. Roger smiled, tinting his slim fingers, but Benny was getting frustrated. Roger, why not? For starters, I have a bad feeling about this law suit. And I read the complaint you emailed me and the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. I sense that there's more here than meets the eye. You know in movies when they say this time it's personal? I get the same sense about this lawsuit. Benny hesitated. Okay, you're right, it's personal. The attorney on the other side is Nick Machiavelli. Do you know him? I've heard of him. He's an old nemesis of Mary's, and she beat him in his last case, and he's coming back with a vengeance. We believe he put the plaintiffs up to this matter. He manufactured the case. Roger blinked. So my intuition was correct. Yes. Then I declined the representation. Roger, come on. You represent lawyers accused of legal malpractice. How much more personal can it get? This is a personal vendetta. Benny blinked. How did you even know that from the complaint? I asked myself why plaintiffs are proceeding under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act as opposed to Title VII. Our firm is too small to be covered by Title VII. We're only four employees and three partners. Roger raised a hand. That's not what's significant here. Although both the federal and state statutes outlaw discrimination on the basis of gender, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act has sharper teeth. Most significantly under the PHRA, a plaintiff can sue a defendant personally and individually. That's what they're doing in this case. You three were named as individual defendants. That's not possible under Title VII. Damn, I shall realize that. Benny pursed her lips, frowning. 
Judy and Mary exchanged glances. They should have realized that too. But they bent to upset. The baby kicked hard like a rebuke. Roger frowned slightly. This provision weaponizes the, the statute. You're personally liable for any damages. It also throws your liability coverage into question. If you're not covered by insurance, then each of you would have to pay damages personally. Understood. Benny nodded and Mary felt a wave of fear. She and Anthony didn't have the financial cushion to withstand a personal judgment. And she felt a wave of guilt too for getting him. Benny and Judy into this for getting him, Benny and Judy into this mess. She was Machiavelli's real target, but they were caught in the crossfire. Roger continued. Secondly, under the PHRA, there's no cap on, com on compensatory damages. As under Title Seven, under Title Seven, damages against even a firm of fourteen employees are capped at fifty thousand dollars. Punitive, yeah, punitive damages are available under Title Seven, but not under the PHRA. But they're so rarely awarded. That it doesn't make a difference for your purposes. So the exposure is broader? Correct. Roger untented his fingers. You have 30 days to answer the complaint. Though extensions are freely given, I would suggest you do not extend. I absolutely agree. That's how we litigate. Yeah, litigate. Even as defendants were aggressive, we take the lead and never let go. In fact, we need to file an answer to this right away. No, you don't. Benny frowned. Why? Don't you want to take the initiative? Yes, I do. That's why I would wait. How is waiting taking the initiative? Benny asked, but Roger only smiled somewhat condescendingly to Mary's eye. I have the same question, Mary said, backing Benny up. Then I'll explain, Roger answered calmly. To answer quickly is to react to Machiavelli. When you react to Machiavelli, you give him the initiative by your actions under the rules. You have ample time to answer. You respond to the rules, not to Machiavelli. Do you see the difference? Fine, Benny answered. After the complaint is answered, the Pennsylvania Human Rights Relations Commission begins in, begins its investigation. As you may know, you'll be dis, you'll be deposed and there will be additional discovery. The focus will be the decisions you made not to hire the plaintiffs, as well as anecdotal or statistical evidence of gender bias in favor of women at your firm. How long do you think that takes? Six months to a year?
Yes. And after a year, the plaintiffs can go to file suit in court. Before that, as you know, the commission will pressure you to settle. We'll never settle. Benny folded her arms and Mary realized they haven't even discussed the the possibility of settlement. Still, she felt the same way and suspected that Judy did too. Roger frowned slightly. I would advise you to keep an open mind about settlement. No, absolutely not. It would be an admission. I know you're going to say it's not, but it is in reality. Nevertheless, settling this dispute without prolonged litigation benefits you and the firm, Roger blinked. This time, I mean, time is also a factor. The fact that they have a year to investigate prolongs the damage to your reputation. Given that they're off to a fast start, reports of the allegations are already popping up online. Benny grimaced. That's why I wanted to meet right away. I also think we should hold a press conference today at the firm. We need to take our case to the media, too. I texted our associate, Anne Murphy, to set it up for 2 o'clock this afternoon. Good, go ahead, even though you're not represented yet. In fact, it plays better. Their complaint is colorable, given the admission by your associate, John Foxman, and he is the only male lawyer employed by you. It's not intentional. Benny flushed offensive. I'm sure it isn't, but the objects are poor and the numbers cut against you. In addition, your firm had its genesis as an all-female law firm. You have made many comments to that effect. It's not an illogical conclusion to think that what you manifested, you intended. The plaintiff's position has a common sense appeal. Judy cringed and Mary was feeling more worried. They needed Roger to take their case and fast. Benny pursed her lips. Don't tell me you think they can win, Roger. On the contrary, I do. The hell they fight, 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 fight them tooth and nail. And tooth and nail. Roger blinked. I'm sure that whichever lawyer you go to will be thrilled with the representation. You know everyone and you'll... Have your pick. Roger, seriously. Benny raised her voice. You can't be turning me away. We've known each other forever. That's why another lawyer will do better for you than I would. Why? This case could not be more important to me. That's why. Roger leaned back in his chair, spreading his elegant hands in appeal. You're facing an existential threat to your law firm. For you, it's your reason for being, your baby, your way of life. Your emotions are at an all-time high. Of course they are. What else would you expect? Nothing else. Roger turned to Judy and Mary. I don't know 
either of you, but I'm sure as partners you share her concerns, temperament, even energies. Yes? Yes, we do, Judy answered, and Mary let it go. She didn't know whose energy she shared. Lately, she didn't have any energy. Thought so, Roger nodded. I operate very differently from you three. Oh, come on, Benny scoffed. Don't be such a control freak. We're all litigators for God's sake. May the Lord forgive me for saying his name in vain, but that's what it says in the book that I'm reading to y'all. But yeah, so forgive me for saying that, Christian people who listen to this podcast of mine. (sighs) True, but we litigate in our own way. Roger paused. Ours is a... Darwinian profession. Litigators are strong. We self-select. Only the toughest survive, so there's lots of toughness. Talk of force, force meeting force, conflict clashes, battle imagery, war, fighting, like this. Roger smacked his hands together, a harsh sound echoing in the still, quiet office. In addition, our justice system is adversarial. There's two teams. There's two teams, two sides. They fight and one wins. So, Benny shot back. Judy looked over, surprised at the crankiness in her tone. Mary was getting cranky herself, since evidently Roger spoke haiku. I'm strong, but there are different forms of strength. I don't fight. I don't use force. I assert. My position, but I remain flexible. My associates are strong, too. But we're, but we're strong in a different way. I'm not sure the Vitez firm and the Rosado firm are well suited. Roger, we're not getting married. We're not even merging. And that's what I mean. Roger smiled slightly. I don't see things the way you do. I don't see the labels and divisions. Relationships are relationships. To me, the relationship between client and attorney is no different from the relationship between lovers or corporate entities. It's about my relationship to myself ultimately. Oh, please, Benny groaned, but Judy tilted her head, obviously intrigued. Mary tried not to throw up again, thinking of all the money that was about to go down the tubes because of Machiavelli. (sighs) Roger shifted forward. Benny, to achieve a successful result. We need to work together. I don't think we'll work together well. Of course we will. Benny threw up her hands. We're a dream client. Or a nightmare client. How dare you? And he spat out and... Even Mary was taken aback. Only Judy was still listening. Roger put up a palm. 
Benny, don't mistake me. It's not personal. That's exactly my point. A personal lawsuit means drama. I call plaintiffs like this plaintiffs because that's what they want to inflict. That's cute, but all the plaintiffs cause pain and drama. Not like this. A oh, bore drama. It dissipates energy and squanders clarity. Why won't you take us, really? Benny bore down. It's because you don't think I'll listen to you, is that it? You'll think we'll have a power struggle? No, I don't seek your obedience. I seek your order. I seek your cooperation. Not everything is binary. Yet that's how you see the world. You will be unhappy with my representation inevitably. As I will be unhappy representing. If I may, Roger. Judy interrupted. I understand what you're saying. I agree that we have a difference in our energies. I know that our philosophies aren't necessarily compatible. Oh, Roger tilted his head, and for the first time, Mary thought his blue eyes showed signs of life. Yes, and it's demonstrated in this very meeting. Benny wants to argue you into taking our case, but she can't. Exactly. Benny looked over with a frown. But Judy kept talking. I've done a fair amount of reading on Eastern philosophy, as you have. I have most of these books, too. I've studied them. Judy gestured at the shelves. After college, I was thinking about becoming a Buddhist nun. What? Mary blurted out, incredulous. She thought she knew everything about Judy. She'd even seen her bra drawer, which was a mess. Meanwhile, Mary's sister was a nun, but a Catholic one, like normal. Mary didn't even know the Buddhists had nuns. Roger being dead, Judy. So why didn't you pursue becoming a nun? I felt I could do more good as a lawyer. I handle the pro bono work that Benny brings into the firm. I think of that as my reason for being, not the firm, not the service. I follow the way. You do. Benny's eyes lifted. Which way? Mary asked, bewildered. The way of the Tao. Judy answered with an unusual, placid expression. Mary looked at Judy nonplussed. She knew her best friend had pink hair and minored in woo-woo. But Judy had gotten even wackier since she bought a loom. Mary wasn't sure how these two things were related, but nobody needed to weave things you couldn't buy woven. Roger folded his sling papers on the brass deck. Oh, then, Judy, you understand. The friend's way of doing things and the fact that this lawsuit is so personal kind of goes against my involvement. Perhaps. Judy said equally calmly. I see your position. Benny's eyes glared in anger. 
Carrier, whose side are you on? Mary was pretty sure that Ben was proving a bitch at this point. Meanwhile, she'd never heard Judy say perhaps before. Mary didn't know what was coming over her best friend and prayed it helped the cause. That is, she prayed to the real God, not whoever they were talking about. Judy nodded. I do understand, Roger. It's interesting, though, that one of my favorite lessons from Laos, from Lao Tzu is about the sage and his philosophy of service. How so, Roger asked pleasantly. Lao Tzu teaches the more the sage helps others, the more he benefits himself. The more he gives to others, the more he gets himself. That is the way of the sage. <clears throat> Roger didn't speak for a moment, and Mary was totally confused, since she thought they were talking about the way of the, the Tao, not the way of the sage. And in any event, she had been raised Catholic, which was my way or the highway. Judy paused. So I hope you'll revisit your decision not to represent us. After all, the words of Lao Tzu, the flexible, are preserved unbroken. Excuse me, ladies. Roger closed his eyes and sat perfectly still for a moment. Judy said nothing. Benny said nothing. Mary held her breath. Roger opened his eyes. I have reached a decision. Chapter 4 Just as Benny, Mary, and Judy were getting ready to cheer, a black landline phone buzzed on and Roger raised an index finger, pressed to the intercom button, and answered the phone. Yes? I'll do. Thank you. He said, hanging up and returning his attention to them. Ladies, Machiavelli is currently holding a press conference regarding the lawsuit. It's being streamed live. Damn it! Then he smacked the desk. He beat us to the punch. Oh no! Judy said dismayed. Bear with me. Roger turned to his laptop, pressed a few buttons, and turned the Laptop faced out as the video began to play. Mary felt stricken. Just seeing Machiavelli, his dark eyes flashing and his hair slicked back. He had on a tailored Zegna suit. Or is it Zena suit? And he sat in the middle of an ornate conference table at his office. Next to him sat three young men in suits, and the room was filled with reporters. Machiavelli was saying, thank you for coming, and I hope you have the copy of the complaint we distributed. This is a very important event, not just an ordinary lawsuit. Before you begin, let me say first that it's undoubtedly true there is sexism in society and that women are discriminated against in many professions. I don't deny, I don't deny that and neither should you. History proves that it's true, not only in employment. Recent social movements show that it's also true in general. It seems like every day there's another hashtag. The reporters chuckled and Machiavelli continued, but of late, it's also true that there 
is discrimination that isn't talked about as much and that reserve discrimination against men. Roger watched the video saying nothing. Mary felt her blood boil. Now he's going to make it sound noble when he's just trying to get me back. Benny growled. I want to crush this kid. Machiavelli continued. Many women who have attained position of influence in the profession use their empowerment as a sword, not a shield. And on occasion, they use it against men. Nowhere is this more true than the case that we filed today with the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission on behalf of these three young lawyers. Machiavelli gestured at the three men and they smiled as he introduced one. Their parents confirming to Mary that the lawsuit was manufactured, if not cast like a movie. Nobody she went to law school with was as handsome as any of these plaintiffs, who looked like three male models in a racial balanced ad campaign. They were all about the same height, which was tall, and same weight, which was super hunky. Michael Battle, who was Asian, had a dazzling smile and a spray of glossy bangs. Grand Madden was African American and he wore glasses but didn't look as if he needed them. And the whitest of guys with blonde hair and blue eyes was Stephen McManus, who sat next to Machiavelli. These three men are brilliant young graduates of top local law schools, but they were not hired by Rosado and Denuncio simply because they are male. There was murmuring among the reporters, and Machiavelli continued. Rosado and Denunzio was founded by Benny Rosado, a, a, proponent, a proponent of women's rights, and she intended her firm to an all-women's law firm. She bragged about it whenever she could in public for over a decade. Benny Rosado hired, cultivated, and promoted only female lawyers, specifically now partners with Mary Denunzio and Judy Carrier, an associate, Anne Murphy. All these women have, at one time, or another described the firm as all female. Imagine what outcry there would be justif justifiable. So if any of the defendants had described their law firm as all white, all black, or all Asian, ups I, I submit to you that legally and, mor and morally there is simply no principled difference between that and describing a firm as all female. Benny kept shaking her head. This scumbag is lecturing me about morals? About laws? Judy sighed. Ugh. Mary didn't know what to say. She had described the law firm that way herself and never thought twice about it. 
She knew that they hadn't discriminated against anybody. But she couldn't deny that Machiavelli was putting them in terrible light, in a terrible light. The law firm of Rosado and Denunzio has only one male lawyer named John Foxman who was hired last year. But don't let that token fool you. Lest you doubt the veracity of our allegations sitting at my right hand is Stephen McManus, who interviewed with Mr. Foxman when an opening for an associate was advertised. During that interview, John Foxman admitted that he often felt out of place as the sole male lawyer. Roger I. The Screen. Foxman is the one in the complaint. Exactly. Benny shook her head, fuming. The gift that keeps on giving. Judy looked over, concerned. Mary kept her own counsel, but she was kicking herself. Almost as much as the baby was kicking her. She should have known that Machiavelli wouldn't wait. She, Benny, and Judy would hold their press conference. But they were already caught off guard. Playing catch up. Machiavelli frowned. Clearly the principles of Rosado and Denunzio have acted unlawfully and in violation of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. And we have filed this complaint to vindicate the rights not only of these plaintiffs, but of men everywhere. National origin and sexual preference. We'll be trying our case in the courts, not the media, so I won't be taking questions today. <coughs> the reporters complained, but Machiavelli waved them into silence. I urge you to continue to pay special attention to this case. I'm not going to show all the cards in my hand now. And surprises are in store. I'm betting that before we even get to court, you will understand the absolute truth of the allegations in this complaint. <clears throat> and the reason... That Rosado and Denunzio should be out of business. Thank you. Machiavelli finished by looking directly into the camera, his dark eyes boring into her through the lens. And Mary knew he was talking to her. She felt a shudder at hearing him threaten the firm so directly. Machiavelli was coming. For them, and she didn't know if they could, even if they were mother's and master. Roger ended the video, turning to them. Breathe deeply, ladies, he said calmly. Hell no, Benny jumped to her feet. He wants a press conference. I'll give him a press conference. Stay tuned. I'm going to be reading chapter five. Not today, but tomorrow. Like I said, today I'm just reading chapters three and four. Not going to be able to do music. But thank you for listening.